What's up, Paladins fans? I hold shift here, and this is what's raging after day three of the World Championship qualifiers. We had two winner's bracket matches in round number two, and then we would finish off the loser's bracket, figure out who would be moving on and still surviving through the rest of round number one. A very exciting day was lined up for us, and it mostly provided... We'll start things off in the loser's bracket, as that's where the day started. It would be Renegades taking on Mouse Sports. And uh, as we were looking at this one yesterday, we were talking about the lack of communication out of Mouse Sports was really potentially the back-breaking element that they were lacking going into this matchup versus a Renegades team that is an understanding of their situation and are just looking to flat-out improve. They're not sitting there with their heads sagging after their round one loss uh, a couple days ago. So... Did they come? Did they prepare? Did they get themselves going? Absolutely yes. We had this one going in favor of Renegades. Remember back going 2-0 as you saw. But as we were look at this map, uh, we weren't sure exactly because the first map started off on Ice Mines and well, anything can happen on Ice Mines. Now, I want to remember, remind you all about what we were saying about the last couple of days. We've been talking a lot about things like mispositioning and overextending and not taking advantage when you have numbers and beyond that, making sure you're utilizing the ultimate economy when it's in your favor. Of course, as spectators, we get to see the percentages and how close people are to ultimates, but as players, they need to be calling out when ultimates are being used and when they believe there are ultimates that are still available for the team. That's what you're gonna be, well, should be hearing in, in team comms if they're happening. I don't know if they're happening for Mouse Sports. And we'll show a couple of examples uh, from this game and the next game as far as what we mean and why those things are important to keep an eye out for and why these games even though they're called super hype because they're 3-3, three, three, it's 99% when it really is nothing more than comeback mechanic and Ice mine, Mines things that are making teams get close. So, let's take a look. It was Ice Mines first and foremost for Mouse versus Renegades, and it would go 4-3, to three, which honestly is just, again, Ice Mines things. Renegades would do a really good job this time around with holding the ultimate economy in their favor. Most specifically, when it was 3-2, Mouse blew every single ultimate they had during a defense when they really didn't need to, to be completely honest. They used almost everything, and kudos for Renegades for forcing themselves through to try to make sure that Mouse used as many ultimates as possible without popping any of their own. But there are also moments here, like you see, for instance, NTBs. We might need to change his name to NT Feeds, because look at this. He's the Fernando player in this clip, and he's running through the barn side. He is going way out into nowhere, and Pretty here calls it accurately. But it's not just that he goes all the way out there. He continues to push forward and gets punished completely, which leads to Renegades just taking advantage time and time again. That ultimate charge that we mentioned before would favor Renegades in the final point. They would win that map 4-3. to three. Bright Marsh, I, I have to give kudos to Bon Scott. He really did show up today with a couple of huge ultimates and much better positioning with his team. This still wasn't really an RNG win, though, I would call it, more than it was a mouse loss. Cephacloud is an absolute monster. He is by far the future of Mouse, if there even is one. And to be completely honest, it was staggers. Again, everywhere. Overextensions. Again, everywhere. From both... Well, not Bulka, because he only died like twice. But from Bees. Again, would just go way too far forward, and he would get absolutely punished for it. So, it would be, as we called it, a 2-0 in favor of running gates but before we leave this and we've got time to play with here so we're going to play with it a little bit as we look at mouse what's the future of mouse whatever it is it needs to be built off of cepha cloud Anja doodle and honestly i think alex needs to be in the consideration pool when it comes to whatever the next season looks like yes there are some issues when we saw alex this last split not really performing quote unquote but he didn't really have a front line to really give him the space he needed when he's playing things like cassie and canessa I think he's super teachable. I think Mouse Sports needs a really good coach to come in and teach these guys to play together before they lose people like Sephiroth Cloud and Andrew Doodle, because they're likely going to get picked up if they're not going to make something more promising happen. Bees, however, I think needs to relearn the game. Some time as a support might actually help him out, just so he can get you know the idea of all right, I'm watching this frontliner do this. This is what I would normally do. Oh, this is why I'm wrong. But I think he needs to be relegated down. I don't think he's at a PPL level. I love the guy. He's super nice. But honestly, his frontline gameplay this entire year has been extremely lacking.
Let's go to the second matchup of the day. It would stay in the loser's bracket on the bottom side. Zaga Talent would take on Cryptic. A Cryptic team that looked pretty solid considering they lost in their first round. And Zaga, who we may have under uh, overestimated. And it would start things off on Bright Marsh. And again, we were talking about things like misutilizing ultimates. Take a look at this clip here. You're going to notice Inara is the only one on the side of Zaga who has an ultimate ability in the face of a number of ultimates from the side of Cryptic. Cryptic pops an illusionary rift. And the response from Zetha was, let me go ahead and seismic crash that. What? That essentially forces the Fernando's hand to use the immortal, which means all of that healing gets extra confirmed. It's, it's just a huge question mark. Why not hold that seismic crash until after the illusionary rift is over? So that way your damage dealers who have no ultimates can utilize their cooldowns and utilize their in-hand damage, damage, uh, damage to actually deal substantial damage numbers to actually win the point back it's moments like this that we were talking about the front line of zetha just being completely clueless never was zetha really playing with his out his off tank and it was just too much for the side of moondog and exterminia to carry to be completely honest but those examples that we mentioned and those happen routinely it goes to the inexperience and kind of the youth of zetha and what are you doing crashing an illusionary rift Draft was thrown, though, to be completely honest in this map. Willow and Cassie was given away, and they were try to respond with a Talus and a Leon. Yikes. They also pull a double stationary front with a Torvald and a Nara. Yikes. The duo damage pull almost pulls it out, though, to be completely honest. Exterminate and Moondog are insane. And I think whatever happens in the offseason, these two guys need to be the consideration for the top Lad M team flat out. Jaguar Falls would come out and uh, woof. It did not look so good for Zaga Talent. The Grok was a good idea. They pick it up into a Ying and Nara, similarly to how Virtus Pro played it. But the problem again is Zetha up front and Puli Yuli just aren't working all that well together. And the thing about having a Grok is that he needs to have the space and the time to let that damage stack up. Vox made up a very good point when he was talking about the Grok just doesn't do burst damage. He kind of shoots at you over time. And that time was never granted to him. The draft was not so great because of that, but the other thing, again, Zetha was literally at certain times walking out of the line of sight of the Maldamba, and Grok and Willow never got a chance to get their poke off, never let that damage stack, and because their fronts died so fast, it ended up just becoming cryptic, rolling right on through like a steamroller. They would win this one, as you would anticipate, at a two maps to none scoreline. Now, let's go back up to the top side of the bracket, where... Some of the interesting games uh, would be played, starting off with Fnatic, their first showing here on land, taking up against Kanga. And if you remember back, this is what we had to say about this matchup yesterday, going into the matchup of Fnatic versus Kanga. I've got this one going Fnatic's way at a 2-0 scoreline. Although I think these maps could be 4-2s, 4-3s, I still think Fnatic, with their experience, their ability to punish mistakes, and their kind of, you know, familiarity to the land environment, will probably supersede that of Kanga. Now, remember just previously how we were talking about all of these mispositions and these throwaways from these younger, more youthful, less experienced teams? That would not happen from Fnatic this time through. There were some sloppy moments from Fnatic, to be true, but... They played pretty exemplary when it came to knowing when they had ultimate advantage, knowing when a frontliner was mispositioned. There were so many times where Fish Echo, he would fly right over a mispositioned Anara and make sure the backline stayed zone away from her, letting the, his frontliner take control of the low HP NR. Just brilliant play through and through. Even though this first game was a 4-3 in the books, the comeback mechanic honestly was the sixth man for Kanga. It should have it was 3-1 to start things off. It was this close to being a 4-1. It was this close to being a 4-2. And ends up going 4-3. And Fnatic, they had the ultimate advantage in the last point. They don't make the same mistakes. They would have thrown, to be completely honest. If they lost that last point, 3-3, it would have been a throw. They had ultimates at the very beginning of the fight, and during the retake, they had ultimate advantage. They used that to their advantage, and they absolutely found some stapled, solid team play out of it. At the end of the day, I honestly feel like the draft cost Kanga in the end. Huge plays were made by the front lines, but it just wasn't enough. There were a couple of great plays at the end where you saw almost off the map went the Inara, Seismic crashing to get back on, and they followed up with it. It was really solid gameplay from the front line of Kang. I'm really impressed by it, but it just wasn't enough. They didn't have the ultimate economy in their favor going into the fight. They tried to make it happen, but Fnatic, they wouldn't make the mistake. Ice Mines would be the second map, and again, Ice Mine things. It would end up going 3-3, and it would be an Andro pick first and foremost. Uh, not first, but it would be an Andro pick for Fnatic, and I wasn't really loving the Androxus pick because... 
There just wasn't enough burst damage for the point. Andrew would dash in, take a couple of shots, he'd get poked out, he had to dash out and lose all of his cooldowns. There wasn't much pressure on the Inara of Kanga. But again, Fnatic had great ultimate control. They baited out a number of ultimates numerous times versus Kanga, giving themselves the ultimate advantage so they could retake fights or secure defenses without having to use much. They would come back, win team fights. It was really, really good. And again, there were just subtle execution mistakes from Kanga. And like we said, they got punished for it by solid Fnatic gameplay through and through. And I, you can see the Fnatic players weren't super happy with the way they played, but honestly, I think if it wasn't for the comeback mechanic and it wasn't for an Ice Mines, this very well could have been a 4-1 and a 4-2 somewhere in there. They played really, really solid. I would have, again, if I go back for Kanga, if you're watching this Kanga players, I would have liked to have, or pardon me, if you're watching this Fnatic players, I would have rather have seen the Cassie, personally. I know how you feel about Androxus, his ability to take down frontliners if they're at half HP, but when you're dealing with the constant pressure, someone has to put burst damage down on the point. I would have rather have seen the Cassie, but again, it's little, it's little, little things, and it comes down to what you're feeling in the moment. They don't have all this, they don't have the time in the world to be considering their draft, so it is what it is. The final matchup would then go over to the side of Splice versus VP. And uh, if you remember back, we were given the consideration that Splice would maybe show up and ride some of the momentum that they had in their first round matchup. We gave them the benefit of the doubt that they would take a map. It didn't look so good as Bright Marsh. Splice got kind of baited. They took away the Talus from the draft as Torvald was picked up, and it left them open to Willow and essentially Zinn for free. They didn't have a response to the Willow. The extra space gain and the extra damage dealt from Willow allowed Zinn to move more freely. VP would utilize that advantage perfectly, and they'd win that map easily. And in the second map, similar situation on Frog Isle. It, it, it kind of felt like Splice was building their draft off of, we need to make sure we're countering Flyers, whether it be Drogos or Willow. We need to find a way to make sure that we dissuade VP from taking it. They had first pick, keep it in mind. So the fourth and thick, fourth and fifth pick, goodness gracious, combining words over here, for Splice's roster would end up being their two damage dealers. They, they hold the Knessa until the fourth pick, and then they pull out an Eevee, which the roster looked good. It was a good draft in theory. But the problem was, Virtus Pro had the final pick, and they were able to count out that draft. They say, well, hey, if you're going to take the Kinesa, we're not going to take Drogos or Willow. We'll just punish you with a different element. Virtus Pro, again, I think they win this mostly based off the draft. Splice never had a chance to really respond to it because of the draft. And as we go forward, we'll talk more about Virtus Pro taking on Fnatic. But we're not there yet, so let's take a look out of the loser's bracket. We have two matchups tomorrow. We already talked about the other two matches in the winner's bracket. If you don't have the link to that video, uh, it's from our video yesterday. I'll link it with a timestamp below in the pinned comments, okay? I'll do that for you. So go back and check out those predictions. But let's do the predictions for the loser's bracket games, because Splice will be taking up against Renegades, and Kanga will be going up against Cryptic. Now, this is going to be, I think, a very, very good two sets, to be completely honest. I honestly, after seeing Renegades come back together, we'll talk Renegades Splice first. After seeing them come back together against Mouse Sports today, I think that their team play is on a level just above Splice, but just. And with Splice making these kind of mistakes in the draft, they feel like they're trying to draft from six months ago. They were so scared of Torvald Talus that they tried to take the Talus away when honestly they could have just bursted it down with good record application. I think Renegades have a more current and modern mind for what the draft needs to look like in this land environment than Splice does. So I'm going to tilt this in favor of Renegades, but only barely. I think this is going to be a good set. I've got Renegades winning this one two to one. Second loser's bracket matchup is going to be Kanga versus Team Cryptic. And the way I think about this match is kind of how I looked at Kanga versus Fnatic. Could Kanga show up and perform against Fnatic and possibly steal something away from them? Yes, but I still think Fnatic is the better team. Copy-paste that conversation, but sub the team names around. Do I think Cryptic have a chance at taking a couple of points and making some mistakes, or capitalizing on some mistakes that Kanga makes? Yes, I do. But I think that what I saw today, Kanga playing up against Fnatic, I would give the edge in favor of Kanga. I'm going to give them a 2-1 advantage here. And honestly, that loss to Fnatic... That was the best thing that could have happened to Kanga because it shows that we are right there. Like, we could beat these guys if we just do little things to turn it around. Whereas Cryptic haven't had much of a test all tournament so far. They stomp over Zaga pretty easily. And they have a good game against um, 
Armada. They don't really show up as well. I think that this was a good proving point and a confidence builder for Kanga losing up against Fnatic. And now with that in mind, I honestly think Kanga has a chance to run at this and finish in the top four. I would not put it past them. I was impressed by their frontline gameplay. I was impressed by the follow-up by the damage dealers. They just need to put a rein on when to use ultimates. And I think Hades is one of the better minds in the game. He's very smart about seeing these things. He's an Overwatch guy. He's a Paladins guy. And the fact that he's been looking at Kanga Overwatch as well, I think he'll start to recognize when they could hold ultimates versus when they can commit to them and if they can put themselves in the ultimate economy ahead of time and make sure that they're capitalizing on five on two situations which is by the way why you guys gave up that last three three point on ice mines you let bugsy sit in the back line for free it was five on two you didn't push your advantage you got it you got to do that i think they're going to see that though and understand that when they see it from the overhead perspective and they'll be more aggressive to make those calls against a weaker more vulnerable team like team cryptic is so i see this one going kanga's way i see them making a potential run they're my dark horse to actually run away with a loser's bracket right now if they keep playing like they did today with a couple of adjustments that's a lot that's a lot of breakdown. If you want to get the information on what we say live when it happens, you'll hear most of that in real time pointing out examples. You need to stop by the Twitch channel tomorrow when we watch the viewing party. The information is right. Oh, there it is. Whoop, there it is right there. Oh, I guess it's more like, like more like this. I, I'm bad at this. I'm bad at the whole interactive thing, but we're learning. Let's go ahead and talk about our win-loss rate and our prediction status because we did not have the greatest of round ones. We're 37.5% on our match calls, and then our maps were just above 60%. We would win them all the day, so we're up to 58% calls. Good for you, ship, and 69% on the map prediction rate. So we're getting there. Our ideas are right. It just comes down to now that we're seeing the teams, the analysis will be a little bit more, you know, foundational. I'm just picking words right now. I don't even know. Let's get out of here. You've heard enough of my voice. We'll see you guys tomorrow for... Day number four. Goodness, I can't believe that we're already there. For the rest of round two, plus the losers bracket matchups to get us closer to making our way through this tournament. And then we'll be switching to five games a day, if I'm not mistaken, which will be oof, Og Champ. Can't wait for that. We'll catch you guys next time. Thanks for tuning in. I've been Ihold Shift, and that's been What's Raging. Later, later. Bye bye.